Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted, with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, John Mink. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, Life Unscripted. I'm so grateful to have you here today. I'm grateful to have you talk about your new book, Forecasting with Outliers. Um, interesting topic. You've been working in the supply chain uh, industry for many, many years, have a lot of experience there. Um, but what brought you to where you are today and writing your book? What, what was the impetus for that? <laughs> um, I felt uh, over the years of uh, uh, being a uh, progressively go through supply chain management, I found it amazing uh, on how companies would do checking the box on processes but that really doesn't understand what the impacts would be from, from a business perspective. And what it's amazing uh, to me is that when you create a demand signal, the whole company is managing uh, the, the, the suppliers to what we're telling the suppliers, what we're investing in from uh, new capacities. What are we doing from price negotiations based off those demand signals? And then if they're really, really wrong, right? Your business has an impact. Mm -hmm. And many times there's different people have to manage the impact of those decisions where you're making these decisions up front and there's an education process in companies. People not necessarily understand the impacts of it. Mm -hmm. And there's been very little uh, time given to you know, what's this, uh, the, the demand forecast, uh, because mm -hmm. they're always focused on some type of execution issue where they could have been managed way up front months ago. In, uh, in, tr in trying to take through many times when I say the forecasting process, there's a lot of bias put in that forecasting process. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get to the result, it ends up being uh, not what you expected and cost the company a lot of money. Mm. Wow. You could, we could go on for days on this topic because I, I worked as a consultant, as we touched on briefly, just before we hit the go button uh, for many years with many businesses. And it's interesting going to each department from department, there'll be certain processes or things that maybe the employees are, are not even aware of that really one one department has one idea of what's going on another department has another idea and then the C cfo controllers all those top brass are, are just have a totally different idea about what's what and it works out to sometimes detriment to the business because customers get lost in the outskirts sometimes the product gets hurt um what have you found that can really bring people onto the same page? Because I find that that's often what's happening. A lot of these big corporations and specifically have everyone working on different platforms. So what, I, what I've really, uh, what the, actually what the book's focus is on, mm -hmm. there's uh, uh, many companies that have implemented a formal sales and operations planning process. And what that means is, you know, every month the company is looking at the roadmap, the product life cycles, determining and honing on those, developing a demand forecast off of that uh, forecast, then understanding what the supply decisions that need to be made, what are your constraints, and then developing an operating plan. Mm -hmm. Very formalized process, a lot of consultants in the area, a lot of companies adopt those processes. And on paper, they make so much sense. They make a lot of sense. But there's one big problem in the process. Hmm. It's people. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it, when you look at it, you've got, uh, when you kind of break up this process to connecting all these dots together to the end result, it's quite difficult because there may be just lack of understanding of mm -hmm. what the impacts are to that type of, uh, to your business. Mm -hmm. And so you really, uh, to me, is how do you manage through the people aspect and the bias aspect mm -hmm. of your demand signal, which drives all your liability or opportunities for your customers. You make, uh, uh, from your suppliers, you can make uh, very, very bad decisions mm -hmm. uh, with the suppliers, create a lot of liability, or the other way around, mm -hmm. uh, you could be well short uh, on product or uh, services because you didn't plan appropriate and you got to go connect those dots. Yeah. So I call it, uh, you kind of need a symphony conductor that can actually work across uh, the organizations to comb it all together and help mm -hmm. people learn. All right. Mm -hmm. This is the, this is the the topic. This is the impact. And then this is the 
uh, risk that we're going to have to live with or not live with. Yeah. Yeah. This is so important. And you're right. Having that, that conductor in the front that can not only see the bigger picture and where all mm -hmm. the pieces are, but how to orchestrate it and get all the top people involved and communicate what needs to happen so that it runs smoothly, like a well-oiled um, machine. It, it's interesting. I remember working for a company many years ago and it was, it was a good company, um, did good sales, all that good jazz, but going deeply into it, there was a lot of unhappy vendors and clients because it was a glitch in the system where they were billing out people inaccurately. Most people in the company would choose or the vendors or, or customers would choose to be billed monthly or annually or biannually. And wow. the system had this funky glitch where it would, after a year, when you renewed or auto renewed, it would switch everyone to a yearly contract. Boom. It would send out one huge invoice. And, and the invoices yeah. at this particular place were pretty large. So at the end of the, you know, renewal, uh, we had uh, potential vendors, clients getting bills of upwards of a half a million and going, <gasps> what's going on? And right. it, it turned out to be a glitch with um, the computer system. Um, but it, there were so many people not talking to other people in departments that no one sure. knew it was happening. And and so this is something that I could see what you're talking about. That but, one thing could just totally have you lose a lot of business. Well, like I say, it would give your accounts receivable team a break for a year uh, <laughs> before they had to go collect. So <laughs> <laughs> I know they're uh, like, why are we not getting anything to collect? Yeah, but yeah. we're losing a lot of contracts. Not good. <laughs> and so in, in, that's the, 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 uh, the, uh, there's a, there's an art, uh, as well as a science to what you're, what you have to manage to. So a lot of times we're trying to divide up many functions on paper. It looks good, but who's making sure these are all connected, right? And understanding uh, that what's happening here could have this risk or impact here. Hmm. And because you're so much focused on, this is my job and I'm going to throw it yeah. over to the wall. And I'm going to throw it over the wall. Mm -hmm. When you come out to the end result, it's bad. I yeah. call it the telephone game when we were kids, when we would whisper something in someone's ear, yeah. it goes all the way around at the end. And you're like, well, that wasn't even close to what we said. And that imagine that in a corporate environment and uh, uh, and get to those results. And so many companies uh, ring in, spend millions of dollars on systems. They put millions of dollars in on putting these processes in place, but forget about then how does it actually run? Because on paper, it looks really mm -hmm. good. But the connections between uh, the uh, inside the organizations, mm -hmm. the outcome is not really what was expected when you when you when you did your planning. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying, John. And and often when I've seen this uh, play out, I've seen different divisions or departments get all, oh no, we're doing our bit, and and they're kind of po finger pointing. Um, yeah. How do you find that one person or persons that can be the overseer? Would it be the CEO or COO that get a good one that can really have a good picture, a above picture? Uh, I could see everything. I mean, what what is your suggestion? I think you know. So you know, depending on the size of uh, the business that you're running and the complexity of those the business that you're running, mm -hmm. I think we uh, uh, I, you look at the the business. If you expect your COO of a large billion billion plus dollar company to be in, involved in this, not necessarily right. You say, oh, that's the COO's responsibility. Maybe or maybe not, and uh, that's what I call it, is that we we, we put these um, uh, structure organizations together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to bring someone in that it actually doesn't actually fit inside. Hey, this person's in supply chain, this person's mm -hmm. in sales, this person's in finance and accounting, that you bring someone else that's like, hey, you know what, you're going to rise above all the functions and making mm -hmm. sure these are connected. And I've been with companies where it has been, uh, uh, quite successful. Uh, a lot of it is just being an, an enabling uh, the individual or individuals on the team to actually work cross functionally, understand, and then learn and say, "Hey, how can we improve our business?" Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times, uh, uh, you gotta you gotta move your ego aside. Uh, you gotta have thick skin, mm -hmm. but you gotta get to the result and the outcome that you plan for. Yeah. So. And it's hard. I mean, yeah. Yeah. imagine having a VP saying, this is the demand, this is going to run, even though all the indicators are, all the indicators are, 
This is not, uh, this is a pipe dream. But we put that pipe dream through, guess what? The liability is could be really severe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like that you mentioned having a third party step in because I've been in, in some corporation for many years. And when you work day to day in a certain situation, sometimes you can't see the forest from the trees. You Absolutely. think, oh yeah. Yeah, you think, oh yeah, we all know what's going on. But sometimes that that different set of eyes that aren't here on a day to day will come in and see things that everyone in all the different departments weren't aware of and can bring to all of your attention. Like, okay, here's where some of the loopholes are that are falling falling about that we could work on together and then give you a starting point on here where the weak points are that we could work on for this plan or process. Right, mm -hmm. right. So. Uh, and I, and I, I think it comes down to is sharing. I felt compelled that I had to write this book because um, I failed much more than I have succeeded, or I feel like I failed a lot more than I succeeded. But at the same time, you know, uh, you start out in your career and you think, you know, as a, as a, you know, you're dealing with the vice president. Well, he or she is probably so smart. I'm not going to, I'm not going to challenge anything a vice president's going to say. Yeah. Then when as you start growing in the corporation, you're like, wow, I mean, uh, what was that individual thinking or driving? Because mm -hmm. when you look at uh, the results, they didn't even come close. Uh, by the way, they're gone now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we brought another one in and, uh, but the business suffered, Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, the business suffered from it. And so it, it comes down to is, how do you simplify uh, pieces in your business? You can focus on everything, but how do you bring your business say, hey, what are the key decisions that we need to make? Mm -hmm. Understanding what are the consequences if it doesn't come to fruition, even a backup plan if uh, a backup plan if the the results don't the uh, your plan does not meet uh, reality. What are the plans there? Mm -hmm. But really tying the organization together at risk as human beings. Mm -hmm. We're just looking to, it's okay. If you're always looking, it's okay to blame. Yeah. You're not helping your business. You're not helping your customers. You're not helping your future growth. Yeah. And uh, you will find in all companies, there's a lot of blame because of not of understanding mm. versus, hey, as an organization, how do we make sure we achieve the best outcome possible? Yeah. Uh, and it's really, really tough to do because we're dealing with humans. Yeah, I, I like that you bring the human element into it because people are people. And, you know, when you've been at some of the companies I've gone to work at, even as a consultant, there are some people that have been at the company for years. And when sure. there's changes made, people begin to fret as my position on the line. Could I be let go? Because a lot of times uh, processes make it so that jobs streamline and people feel like, well, maybe you won't need me. Uh, one one particular company had hired me, uh, had zero A are kind of process in place and we're kind of just taking orders whenever uh weren't really having any contracts or anything like that and i was like whoa we really need to work on that um but what was when i came on board and put through okay here's what i think we should do the sales department was like whoa we're gonna lose all our sales people aren't used to having to do credit checks and stuff like that um but you know it's having the, <laughs> yeah i know they were like wait a second i was but like it's Go. risk mitigation, right? And yeah. it's uh, exactly. But it was so. having that conversation with them to say, no, we get you. We're going to have the financial talk here in finance. We're not going to let you do that because you just yeah. give them the paperwork. They'll talk to us about, you know, going through all the financial work because that's not your lingo. Um, but, you know, I, I would tell them, hey, when you go to the store and, and get like, say, a lease for a car, um, you don't expect they'll just let you walk out without checking your credit, right? Well, the same goes for our, our hundred or two hundred thousand dollar products. Uh, we have to make sure they can end up paying right. for it at the end of the day. And it's a good in, in an example of that's putting the cart before the horse. You got to put the <laughs> horse in front of the cart before yeah. uh, you, you invest in those opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love this. Now, let's say there's a new business owner listening in. He doesn't really have much of a process going on and things have been a little lackadaisical. And he's like, where do I even begin to get good operations in my company going? How do I begin to even approach that? Yeah, that's a good question. And it, and again, you know, it comes to a matter, matter of what the business is really suffering from and needing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say, first off, I'm a big believer 
in a formalized sales and operations planning process. And again, that's demand all the way through execution and then keep working that and learn from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a huge believer in the process. And so to me is uh, looking at what are our biggest pain points and mm -hmm. can a, a formal sales and operation process at least help, help those pain points. Yeah. But then, uh, so really as you start with, hey, one of my biggest pain points, I'm bleeding too much inventory, I'm bleeding too much excess and obsolescence. Uh, my biggest pain points is that I'm losing customers because mm -hmm. my service levels are bad. Why? Mm -hmm. Back it up and say, hey, what actually are my biggest pain points? And can a sales and operations planning help? Or it could be something that, hey, you could do something smaller, um, not put a whole formal sales and operation planning in, but what's that pain point? Why is it there? I understand mm -hmm. the whys. And back up to say, hey, is there a potential solution? Like an example would be mm -hmm. a lot of companies say, yeah, sales and sales and operations planning is the holy grail. Mm -hmm. No, all you need to know is where your inventory is at your customer level. And it's pretty easy to get. Mm -hmm. And that actually could solve a pain point because that can anticipate, you know, how well your sales are stacking up or, or your customers inventories are stacking up. And that may solve a potential pain point that without having that visibility, you don't have to put a whole sales relations planning process in. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, really, to me, what are your mm -hmm. biggest pain points? The why, 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 why? And then yep. back it up to what's the, uh, what can we do to change those pain points? Uh, I love that. And uh, that's one of the biggest questions in sales. What are the pain points of your, your ideal customer? Um, you know, you're here to help them. But one thing I'll add that I think is really important and often missed in many corporations is really having that communication with the people in the front lines, AKA your employees, um, because often they'll have the answers to these questions and to really be open at, to them. What, what, what are you laughing? I'm curious. I, I you, you just say that it's amazing. Uh, it, you know, I, the company I'm with, it's been 18 months there. Mm -hmm. And the usual go in, you run the supply chain, every company say the same thing. We got the worst supply chain on the planet. It's <laughs> awful. It's terrible. The people stink. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 right. And you just find out it's like, we haven't done anything, but we always focus on the, the, the end result versus how do we get here? And yeah. we blame the people uh, for holding the ball at that time. That's mm -hmm. where you start shooting versus, well, wait a second. They had nothing to do with all the planning. They didn't have anything to do with mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the sale, mm -hmm. they're basically here holding the ball. And when it's bad, it's their fault versus like, okay, what, a, uh, what, how did the process get our, ourselves to this point? And then yeah. you'll find, right. Well, you'll find there's gems in the rough that a lot of them basically have been beaten to submission mm -hmm. and it's re ridiculous to try anymore. That's where apathy sets in yeah. to your company. Yeah. That's where apathy okay. steps in. And when you have apathy, it's over. Mm. I mean, game over. Uh, yeah. There's a good, not going to improve, and I'm just going to do my job. And if I get fired, I get fired. That's the worst thing uh, you can allow in your company is apathy. And what I find is, you find so many gems that have never been a chance to uh, mm -hmm. provide input or shine or actually feel important that their input counts. Are very sometimes very threatened by. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a higher level uh, individual in the company and you have to break down walls and barriers. Mm -hmm. And that's really important as a leader yeah. coming in, breaking down these walls and barriers to get us to the right outcome. People are very, very, um, uh, can be uh, obviously many times beaten to submission. Yeah. And that's, that's the last thing you want in your uh, employee base. Yeah. No, I, I love that you went here because uh, there was a company I worked at many, many years at years ago where um, the director of shipping um, was not getting along with the production uh, or director. He was very, kind of a bully. And so there was this. Not, yeah, kind <laughs> Did of you say production director and bully? I think yeah. that's in the job description. Yeah, probably. So. <laughs> yeah, he was he was. A bit of a bully. So, yeah. um, but anyway, there was uh, shipments were not getting out on time. Uh, we weren't getting our bills out. It was a whole mess. But the shipping guy was was a superstar. He was really, really trying to get things out on time. But the production department wasn't able to fulfill their part. Yeah, and there absolutely. was this tension with this one guy who had this 
very negative energy. And uh, finally, w- once I came in, because I, I don't, yeah, I'm very tough with people. I will not allow you to disrespect uh, me or another employee. Exactly. Um, and within very short time, he was fired. And what do you know? Things started to shape up between those two departments. But I, I see what you say. When people are apathetic or you have someone with a uh, negative attitude, it can affect all the different chains of how everything work and shut it all down. You know, it's funny. Uh not funny. It's that you know you experience over time is that you know as we've migrated through time, especially in leadership. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of people get into leadership because of their drive and their passion, mm-hmm. and uh, you know my ways works and has always worked. But what uh, if you cannot evolve yourself as a leader? What worked back in 1980? does not work in 2020 yeah. and you've got to be uh, agile as a manager to deal with it. I, you know, I will talk to a boomer or a gen, gen uh, Xer, very different than how you start working with a millennial uh, Gen Z in the workforce. And by the way, very, very bright, very, very bright mm-hmm. nuances. They can run Excel like no one's business, but yeah. but you've got to be able to be, uh, you got to be agile as a leader to go help manage through it just because it worked in the past. Hmm. You can never rely on that is uh, that's going to work in the future. And think of all the turnovers companies are going through because of just on that, on that very basis of not having the leadership that's agile enough to manage it. Yeah. Uh, And really it takes being humble. Uh, I know my, my, my um, husband, the pilot, not for um, work, but uh, there used to be a thing in the in the cockpit of the majors, you know, American or any of the big airlines, where in the past, way back in the past, it, it was whatever the captain said, everyone's got to listen. And there were some terrible consequences, accidents because of that. And mm-hmm. they, they made a rule that said, no, 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 everyone on the team, everyone in the, you know, who's working in the front uh, has a say, and the captain has the final say, but everyone gets to speak their, their mind. It's not mm-hmm. let, let the ship go down down because we're going to just listen to the captain. And uh, so that same idea has to come to offices that you're like, you know, ruling over people, you really have to work with your people together and uh, lead them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, you know what, we could go on for hours with your book, but I don't want us to leave without everyone finding out how they can get their very own copy of forecasting with outliers. How can they do that? Uh, they go uh, really easily. It's on most online bookstores around the world. Uh, you can go on Amazon. You can go to BAM. You can go uh, Target.com. There's there online bookstores everywhere. So you'll just type in the name Forecast with Outliers. That'll pop up. You can get the, the bookstore. And I'll just put it, this is not a boring supply chain book. This is really taking experience levels, understanding what happened, and what did you do differently to help improve uh, improve your company and what has happened. And I, I felt compelled to write this very easy read. Uh, you don't need an MBA. You're not going to fall asleep because I'm not putting formulas together. I'm using the, uh, I'm using the human element to this one on the, on the art versus the science of it. Mm. Yeah. And, and really, you're just showing through your real life experience uh, ways that people can work on building their operations better. Uh, so everyone, please go to johnminkconsulting.com. Uh, go to Amazon or any major bookstore. And get a copy today of Forecasting with Outliers. Thank you so much, John, for coming to Savvy Broadcasting. Christina, thank you for having me. You betcha. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more savvy episodes and savvy biz tips, go to www.lifeunscriptedradio.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at lifeunscriptedradio.com.